did you get the nerve? I mean, who does that? <laughs> Over 60 years of broadcasting, she used the question mark to build a legendary career. Did you get married to prove that you were not gay? No, I got married because uh, I didn't confront the, the real problem in my life, that I was a drug addict. Can I ask you something very directly, which may seem rude? In our country, we read that you are unstable. We read that you are mad. <laughs> you know that those things have been printed. Yeah. Why do you think this is? Other leaders are disliked, but they're not as controversial as you are. She interviewed everybody we wanted to hear from. There are those who would say that you add to the attention. No, I don't. Well, the masks, the the mysterious behavior. There's, no, there's no mysterious behavior. Why did you kill John Lennon? I thought by killing him, I would acquire his fame. <laughs> you cry on this program, <laughs> I won't run any of it. it was you, that you promised me you wouldn't wrong. cry. <laughs> In the new business of television, the screen was glass, and so too was the ceiling. Barbara broke through both and became the most important woman pioneer in the history of TV news. The fact that I ended up on television, I never, ever thought that would happen. She began working in television in the early 50s, at a time when nearly half the homes in the country didn't even own one. She got her start off camera at local stations in New York working her way up to a job as a writer on NBC's Today Show. I was a writer on the Today Show. They had to have one female writer. She did the tea pouring, as I call it. She did the fashion shows. She did the celebrities. What lit up the newsrooms of New York and eventually the television screens across America was the torch of her 1,000-watt ambition and her unmistakable talent. Barbara Walters proved that there was room on the small screen for more than just men. Barbara is with me right now to give us a filmed report. Would you tell me, was this a very trying experience for oh, you? Frank, it was awful. I mean, first of all, every day I had to go and look at fashion shows. Oh. And then I had to have lunch at Maxime's and drink champagne. Oh. And then I had to smell all the perfume at Dior. Oh. I mean, it was so trying that I took absolutely the very last plane I could to get back here today. At first, most of the work she was assigned to do was less than serious. We're going to be talking about something very feminine right now, fashion. This year, vinyl is the most exciting new fashion fabric. It was the prevalence of pants. As the Today reporter, I did several stories. One was a day in the life of a playboy bunny. It's like a ballet movement, kind yes. of. But her first on-air report on a national news event came on an historic day in November of 1963. The new medium of television and the new reporter coming of age during a nation's heartbreak. One group of young men kept a very special vigil. These are the honor guards who have been guarding the casket of President Kennedy. Soon, she became a regular. Good morning. I'm Frank McGee, and Barbara Walters is here. And Frank McGee went to the head of the network and said that I could not ask the hard news questions. They all had to be done by him. And what they finally decided to do was that he could ask four questions, and then I could come in and ask one. If I could do the interview outside of the studio, it was mine. So I started to look for interviews outside of the studio. Mr. Secretary, this brings up one of the criticisms about you today, and that is that people say Henry Kissinger deals in excessive secrecy. When you were a child and you were different from the other kids, did they make fun of you? What are you the least tolerant of these days? Lies or foolishness about me. The only mistake I ever did, the only harm I ever did was sing over the rainbow. How would you like future generations to remember General Eisenhower? There's certain fundamentals, and that's honesty, integrity. And that's what I hope they'll remember. This morning, we mourn the death of our dear friend and our most respected colleague, Frank McGee. When Frank McGee died, I became co 
host. From then on, I think up to today, the women on the morning shows are co-hosts. That's a nice legacy to have. As the first woman co-host of a morning show, the other networks took note. So in 1976, ABC trailing in the ratings behind the other two networks sought to raise its profile by luring away one of its competitors' biggest star. The last place network came calling with an offer she could not refuse. It would change her life and the business of TV news. Barbara Walters, who has been on the NBC Today program for 13 years, signed a contract with ABC Today. It was more than double the salary of the most famous anchor of the day, Walter Cronkite. Her contract for a rumored million dollars a year specifies that she'll co-anchor the ABC Evening News, among other network appearances. Walters becomes the first woman to be an evening news anchor on network television and the highest paid journalist. In those days, nobody thought it was possible. Harry Reisner, Barbara Walters, bring you the news. I have a new colleague to welcome, Barbara. <laughs> Thank you, Harry. The brash woman from another network's morning show, making more money than the man who had been happy doing the job alone not exactly a recipe for success. I've kept time on your stories and mine tonight. You owe me four minutes. <laughs> Harry Reasoner did not want a partner, and he certainly didn't want a woman. He wasn't joking. The reluctant partnership became a national punchline. I have to shoot an arrow into Barbara Walters. Ah, uh, you mean you're making her fall in love with Harry Reasoner? No. Harry just paid me to shoot her. Just didn't care. Stay Thanks away. Only nice to see you. How about I remember reading the headline in one of the papers, Barbara Walters' failure. At the same time, I was doing these specials, which had been an afterthought. Countdown, four, three, two, one. The Barbara Walters Special. The specials saved my life because they took on a role of their own. People liked them. What's the biggest misconception about you? Um, I think the biggest misconception is that I'm a bitch, maybe, if people think that. Now, uh, why do they think that? Why do you... Because I'm I mean, just why... like you. I have standards. I interviewed Fidel Castro and spent almost a week with him. Also, I spent a great deal of time in the Middle East and did the first and almost the only interview that uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, Menachem Begin, did with President Anwar Sadat of Egypt. They had never talked together before until this interview. Good evening, I'm Hugh Downs. And I'm Barbara Walters, and this is 2020. It would become her home for the next 25 years, and she broke yet another record with the most watched television news interview of all time. Did you ever tell Bill Clinton that you were in love with him? Yes. You did. What did he say? He said, that means a lot to me. Did he ever tell you that he was in love with you? No. There was no question, it seems, she wouldn't ask. I'm going to ask you a terrible question. Did you ever order anyone killed? Yet. Are you sorry you didn't burn the tapes? Yes, I think so, because they were private conversations subject to misinterpretation, as we have all seen. Whether ex-presidents, sitting presidents, or future presidents, none escape the tough question. Shall we begin the torture? <laughs> yes, that's why we chose you. You maintained your courteous relationship, even your friendship, over these years with President Nixon. That if he killed any of the hostages, you would then attack militarily. Absolutely. We are on the verge of a recession, if we're not already there. We see our educational program failing. We see our competitiveness in doubt. Do you feel any responsibility for this? Are you sorry that you ever said, read my lips, no new taxes? Mr. President, how important is it for the president to be a role model? Was it worth it if there were no weapons of mass destruction? Now we know that that was wrong. Was it worth it? Mr. President, there are some folks who say that you squandered your political capital with the health care plan when you should have been focusing on jobs. How can you unify the country when you make these divisive statements? But while best known for her interviews, she was also a cornerstone of our ABC News division, covering breaking news events for close to four decades. We would not under any circumstances think of doing this broadcast without Barbara Walters. Good morning, Barbara. Good morning, Peter. 
This is, as you have said, uh, a unique ceremony. It is unprecedented in history. I want you to wake up the kids because this is the kind of thing they're not going to see again for like another 20 or 30 years. But the show she may have been most proud of was the pioneering daytime talk show, The View. There had not been a show with a group of people sitting together and talking unscripted. It's a great place to express yourself, give opinions, show the kind of person you really are. In 2010, Barbara shared a hot topic of her own. Later this week, I'm going to have surgery to replace one faulty heart valve. I have known of this condition for a while now, and my doctors and I have decided that this is the best time to do the surgery. And since the summer is coming up, I can take a nice vacation. The surgery went off without a hitch, but that vacation was cut short when a VIP forced her to return earlier than expected. We were the first daytime talk show to have a sitting president as a guest. Uh, look, I was trying to find a show that Michelle actually watched. <laughs> yeah. The view has shown that women can be together and enjoy each other and have the kind of conversations that you may have in the morning with a girlfriend. We want to give our kudos uh, to Barbara Walters. This is the house that Barbara Walters built. You know, looking back, perhaps Barbara Walters put it best. I have been blessed with a life I never expected. And helping me up the steps of the ladder over the years have been hundreds of people. Any newswoman on TV walks in formidable footsteps and is without question in her debt. Because you're really the reason why we're all here. You're the reason why I wanted to be in television. And many of us pay tribute to her in person when she retired from The View in 2014. And we all proudly stand on your shoulders, Barbara Walters, as we honor you. Please welcome Robin Roberts. I never set out to be a, a trailblazer. I never said, I'm going to do this you know, for women, but I guess it's what had to be done. And as for the women who followed me, I'm very supportive of women. I know what the women on the air have gone through, and I've kind of become a, a sort of unofficial advisor. If they make it, I get all the credit. I want to be remembered in television, maybe as a creator, maybe as a good news woman. No, more than being remembered, I hope that by younger women, I can help them aspire. I just want to say, this is my legacy. These are my legacy. And I thank you all. And what an incredible legacy it is. Such an extraordinary career in life. Joining us now on the phone is World News Tonight anchor David Muir. Uh, they have known each other for nearly 20 years. David, this loss is being felt all across our industry, but also so many friends and family members mourning her loss tonight. Well, no question about that, Phil. And thanks for having me on. You know, it's extraordinary to hear Robin uh, narrate the impact that Barbara Walters had, not just on journalism, but on uh, the broadcast industry as a whole. And all of those uh, wonderful, accomplished women who came after Barbara Walters, you heard Oprah Winfrey say, you know, we stand on your shoulders. Um, and, and it's an extraordinary thing for Barbara to have acknowledged late in her career the impact she had on so many uh, young women coming up uh, behind her. And, you know, and dare I say, Phil, that it's not just, you know, women uh, who she was a role model for. I mean, I think anyone who grew up in the age of uh, television and broadcast news, we were all influenced by Barbara Walters, by her standards, by her hunger, by her her constant uh, hard work at sort of going after the next big interview and asking the question that would um, get whoever the newsmaker was that was sitting across from her to, to answer the question in the way that none of us thought was possible. I mean, that was the extraordinary thing about Barbara Walters. She broke barriers behind the scenes, but she broke news on camera. She got people to say things that they never would have said to, you know, another journalist. I, I remember Barbara telling 
uh, me the story. And, and she told the story often about interviewing Richard Nixon and why didn't he burn the Watergate tapes? Uh, and she she famously told the story about this you know, obviously very important interview with Nixon. And then she was um, sitting on the notes that she had written. She, Anyone who knew Barbara uh, along the way, and I was lucky enough to be one of so many people influenced by her, but anyone who knew her knew that she spent so much time on the questions she would ask these newsmakers. And one of the, the, the most moving stories about these high-profile interviews was the interview with Richard Nixon, where she conducted almost the entire interview sitting on the questions that she had prepared, and she didn't miss a beat. She made news and made history, uh, given the fact that she got Nixon to a- answer that that all-important question. But that's just one example. There was the Fidel Castro interview, uh, the first woman, of course, to co-anchor a network evening newscast. And then she would continue to break barriers in every corner of her career, you know, just at the end of, of Robin Roberts' piece there. You know, Barbara's, you know, um, yeah imagination uh, and creativity that came to life on The View uh, and and her vision for that program, which, as we all know, still is such a wild success to this day. And, you know, when I learned the news just a short time ago, Phil, I, I thought about you know, sort of my um, last moment. And this is what so many of us are going to do, the people who, who were, you know, lucky enough to have come in contact with Barbara through the years. But one of my last exchanges, interactions with her was walking out to the set on that final day of The View. I was beyond honored to have been asked by Barbara to walk her out on that final day. And she was completely at peace. And anyone who knew Barbara knew that she worked until the last moment, until she retired. Uh, she would be the first one to call into the newsroom, even in the end, for World News to, to be on set. If there was a large uh, story breaking, she would join us on set. But but when she asked me to walk her down the hallway to the view, the final the final episode with that extraordinary surprise waiting for her, all of these women she had influenced, all of these women who we know, their household names uh, in American television, you know, Robin Roberts, Diane Sawyer, Connie Chung, Jane Pauley, all of these incredible journalists who, who were there to honor her on that final day of the view. And to have walked her out there. I will never forget that day. I, I know when I walk down that hallway to do world news every night that Barbara bravely, uh, as the first woman on, on the network evening news, uh, held that role long before any of us did. Um, and she's an extraordinary, extraordinary um, human being, journalist, pioneer, legend, all of those words that get tossed around so often, Phil, uh, that they've almost become cliche. Uh, not when it comes to Barbara Walters. Uh, perhaps she is one of uh, a, the few among us who deserve each and every one of those uh, words as we all honor her. Um, and perhaps it's fitting as we mark the end of this year and the beginning of a new year that uh, that we honor Barbara Walters because she, at the end of so many years, brought us the most fascinating people of the year. Uh, and here we find ourselves at the end of this year honoring our friend uh, and a true pioneer, Barbara Walters. Beautiful and poignant thoughts, David. You know, as you're talking about uh, her interviewing, especially that interview with Richard Nixon that really left an impression on me as well. Uh, I w- talk a little bit, if you can, about not just the questions. The questions were so amazing and, and pointed uh, and, and brave at times, depending on who she was uh, interviewing. But for me, it's as much the reaction she got from the people she was interviewing, and, and you mentioned the Nixon interview. To watch him answer that question, are you sorry you didn't burn the tapes? There was no uh, anger on his face or anything. He just said, yeah, yeah, I am. So for me, it was also the reactions and how she got so much out of the newsmakers, the leaders of the world when she spoke to them. And it's so important, Phil, to remember when she entered the industry. It was uh, largely a male-dominated industry at the time, as we all know. And she um, she took a lot of heat in the beginning because she asked very human, very pointed questions. Really, the questions that mattered, quite frankly, with all of these newsmakers that she sat across from, whether they were uh, presidents, uh, first ladies, former presidents, former leaders, um, and in every one of those interviews, she not only asked the questions that any of us would be expected to ask, but she asked the questions that would you know, elicit a human response. And we all learn from that. And I think that that's what you're um, talking about, Phil, and that she was, you know, she was able to get Richard Nixon, but she was able to get so many world leaders and, and, and the people of our times 
to, to answer questions that they wouldn't have answered sitting across from anyone else. And that that was her way. And, you know, for all the people who critiqued her early on, you know, I, I just hope they were around long enough to see at the end of this remarkable career that that not only not only was she paving the way for so many of us, she was teaching us uh, essentially how it's done. You know, she got the answers, but she also got so much more than that in, in her interviews along the way. And she 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 literally created opportunity, um, you know, for for so many who came after her. And, you know, that that visual of all of those you know, remarkable uh, women journalists who walked out onto that that stage. And I just remember being there that day and thinking, you know, I grew up watching so many of them and obviously grew up watching Barbara Walters. And, you know, I just wanted to quietly say, you know, Barbara, it's not just women you've been a role model for. You've been a role model for so many journalists uh, in this country, particularly broadcast journalists, because of her, her, and you said it, Phil, her bravery. You know, Barbara was brave. She was a trailblazer. A barrier breaker. She went places uh, in the world that were not welcoming, uh, and she did it long before so many others uh, did. And uh, for that bravery, you know, let's all just toast her um, this New Year's. Absolutely, David. I, you know, I think back to the first time I, I thought to myself, I, I want to ask questions uh, of, of people for a living. I want to get answers. I, I was watching a special, uh, one of Barbara's specials when I was young. I, I think it's, it's so right what you say about how she, she taught through what she did. I also think she, she taught through how she lived. Uh, in Robin's story, you heard her talk about this assignment she was given, a, a day in the life of a Playboy bunny. You know, I, I can't help but think from that all the way to Fidel Castro, so many presidents, every newsmaker, she taught by the way she lived. If someone's telling you you can't do this, if someone's telling you we don't think you should do this, but you think you should do this, you go ahead. And, and she taught generations of people by just what she was, as you mentioned, brave enough to do in an industry that was definitely not ready for it when she was ready to do it. Yeah, no question about that. And, and of course, we remember, you know, she spent time uh, at NBC News, uh, you know, a pioneer on the Today Show uh, before she came to ABC uh, and, and did the evening news, did uh, 2020, of course, uh, an honor to be a part of that franchise now all these years later after uh, she uh, made it, uh, you know, what it is uh, all these years later. Uh, and to your point, Phil, I think that that speaks to uh, an age in television, you know, when she was eager uh, and hungry and hungrier than than the men who were in the business to get the job done and i think that you know from the, from some of the assignments that were given to her early on you, you mentioned some of those from the silly assignments I, i'm sure uh, that that what she taught us all these years later you know men and women in the industry is sure i'll, I'll take that assignment but i'm also going to do um, the the vital work the important work that we do every single day i'll do what you're asking me but i'm going to go after the newsmakers too and that's what barbara walters did you know she used the assignments that they were willing to give her in the beginning to get her foot in the door and then she just blazed that path by going after every single newsmaker she wanted to sit across from and, you know, Barbara Walters landed all of those major interviews for so many years. And um, and and for all of that, I, you know, I think that we we you know, not only owe her a debt of gratitude for 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 setting an example for the rest of us, but just think of all of the, the news and information uh, that she brought to us all of those years because she just never gave up. And I remember I have this photograph I still carried around, you know, <laughs> on my phone of, you know, Barbara turning the corner, walking, you know, down to the World News Tonight newsroom on the second floor there on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, um, you know, very late in her career, right before she retired, ready to file another piece on World News. I mean, that spoke to her, you know, her uh, just her devotion to this field that she, um, you know, not only conquered, but then defined for many, many years across, uh, you know, NBC and then, of course, many, many years at ABC. Um, and and we now broadcast out of the, you know, the Barbara Walters building there on 66th Street. And I remember the day it was named in her honor after uh, after her storied career. Um, and I know that not only those of us in journalism and in the broadcasting industry, but people across the country who grew up for many, many decades um, watching Barbara Walters and her interviews and what 
who would she name the most fascinating person of the year? What would she get them to say? How will she make news tonight? Those were the questions America asked, and, uh, and we all learned from her in that way, too. Yeah, it was it was television that everybody in the nation had to watch because they know they they were going to see an extraordinary conversation uh, conducted by an extraordinary journalist. She was going to ask questions that you knew were going to be uncomfortable for the person to answer. Uh, I'm sitting here thinking about uh, her characteristics and her wor and and words that describe her. David, we talked about uh, bravery. She was determined uh, at the beginning of her career and, and throughout it. She persevered. Um, you've been here almost 20 years. Um, I, I know you're talking about that moment when she turned the corner, but do you have, uh, do you want to share any particular um, moment that you shared with Barbara over the years? Well, you know, particularly in the end of her career, I will say, you know, her grace and her gratitude. I think that Barbara recognized in the end, and you heard that clip there that you played not long ago, her her um, farewell on The View, it, it is hard not to recognize the impact you've had when so many um, revered women journalists are standing in that one studio, you know, to thank you for, for the opportunities uh, and, and for paving the way uh, for them. And I think that she recognized that in the very end, the impact that she had. And, and I, and I, I, you know, I mentioned that moment coming down the hallway because it, it had, you know, it had an impact on me, but it had an impact on all of us who were in the newsroom that day. Her willingness to, to come file another report for the evening news after all of those years in the industry. She didn't have to do that, uh, but she did it because she loved what she did. She knew it had impact and she knew, um, you know, the importance of, of what it is that we all set out to do. You know, we to varying degrees, you know, um, might have success from night to night. Um, but always sort of aim higher. And she was one of those people who did exactly uh, the same thing and, and, and for so long um, and, and in a time that was not um, welcoming, in, particularly in the very beginning, and to keep coming in no matter what. You know, I just have always, you know, uh, had the most profound respect for her knowing what she was up against and the fact that she just did not give up and in the end, uh, defined a craft and an industry for the rest of us. Well, 93 years old, and it, you know, an extraordinarily long and incredible life, uh, it, not to mention what she did in her career. Uh, when, her, when her book came out, uh, so many people in my life read it, uh, specifically you know, women in my life, and said, wow, this is, this is so, so remarkable. Look at everything she's done. But you're right. Barbara Walters, the power of Barbara Walters, the grandeur of who she was and what she did in this business, it goes beyond smashing a, a glass ceiling for women in this business, but decades and decades of journalists, both men and women, held Barbara to this standard and watched what she did, how she asked questions, uh, and kind of modeled their, their styles after her, right? I think there's no question that's the case. And, and you know, as I said earlier, it's not just, you know, those who, who say she paved a way for women because she absolutely did, and there's no question um, the impact that she had. But 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 the rest of us too. I mean, I think anyone who grew up in sort of the age of television, watching um, Barbara Walters, you know, globetrot and travel the world and chase down world leaders, not just you know here at home, but all over the world. You know, her interview with Fidel Castro um, and 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 so many others. I mean, she was she was determined, and she set an example for so many. Um, and. And I do think that, you know, her legacy will be, you know, did I have half the energy, half the devotion, dedication to this, this incredible privilege that we all have to, to sort of report the news to sort of the American people? Did we, did we give it, you know, half as much as Barbara Walters did? Um, and, and that would be saying a lot because there were, there were few who um, carried sort of uh, this – endless energy uh, that Barbara Walters did. And she would land a newsmaker and immediately be on to the next project. And, and she, she um, has, was just simply extraordinary in that way um, and was 
so inventive along the way too. You know, she, you know, the Today Show, which obviously still is a franchise to this day. You know, she was part of that in the very, the very early stages, and 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 her role as a woman on that show. And and you mentioned the assignments that she would be given early on in her career. And and I'm, you know, not only am I convinced of it, but she spoke to this uh, often uh, later in her career that she would take those assignments and then chase the assignments that she really wanted. Um, and I think that we all saw that on full display during her many, many decades at uh, ABC News, uh, from the evening news to the news magazines to her specials, the 10 most fascinating people. Um, you know, she was an icon and she defined um, so much about this industry and, and certainly an era in American television that goes beyond just, uh, you know, um, broadcast news. And so I just hope that everybody thinks about uh, Barbara as we mark a new chapter and a new year and perhaps an interview or a moment or a newsmaker that she that she you know was successful in getting to answer a, a question that we all want answered and and you know raise a glass to Barbara Walters, if we will. It's a beautiful way to put it, David. Thank you for, for the thoughtful comments on, on our colleague, Barbara. Uh, like all of us, I, I know you're grieving her loss, um, but thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. All right. We have this tonight from Bob Iger, the CEO of the Walt Disney Company. I have sad news to share today, says Barbara Walters passed away this evening at her home in New York. Barbara was a true legend, a pioneer, not just for women in journalism, but for journalism itself. She was a one-of-a-kind reporter who landed many of the most important interviews of our time, from heads of state to the biggest celebrities and sports icons. I had the pleasure of calling Barbara a colleague for more than three decades. But more importantly, I was able to call her a dear friend. She will be missed by all of us at the Walt Disney Company, and we send our deepest condolences to her daughter, and that is from Bob Iger. Joining us on the phone right now uh, is Deborah Roberts. Oh, we're trying to get Hi. Deborah right now. Oh, Deborah, you're there. Good, thank you. I'm here. Um, your thoughts tonight on, on this sad passing? You know, Phil, I, I think about Barbara, and yes, it is sad. It is, is very sad news to hear, but it is also um, just a celebration of a life, of a life and a legacy, and a woman who just meant so much to so many of us. I mean, I think about when I got the phone call from Barbara Walters. I will never, ever, ever forget picking up the phone one day and getting a call from Barbara Walters saying she wanted me to join the, the, the crew at 2020. And I, you know, it was a shame. Beard, of course, she was a, a broadcaster that I had just looked up to. And I just absolutely could not believe it. I was screaming, you know, to be able to come over and to join 2020. She called me personally to uh, invite me to come over and speak with her and Victor Neufeld, who was the executive producer at the time. And uh, you know, for somebody like me, a journalism you know, student who grew up watching her and, and, you know, certainly making my way up the ladder in local news. It was it was something that was really phenomenal. But what was even more um, awe-inspiring to me was just watching Barbara at work. Um, I'll never forget when I sat on the set with her for the first time with Hugh Down. And I sat there nervously, you know, gathering my notes and thinking what I might say to Barbara, you know, about my report that I had worked on because we would sit at the, the desk and talk about our stories at the end and debrief. And Barbara, during my, my story, took my papers and threw them on the floor <laughs> and said to me, you don't need those. Let's you and I just sit here and talk. We're going to have a conversation. You know your story. I know what you want to talk about probably. Let's sit here and chat. And I thought, what is this, some kind of hazing? What is going on? And I realized that Barbara was trying to give me a lesson about, you know, believing and, and, and thinking about your story and broadcasting in a way that was really believable and that, that was real and and honest, and uh, I'll never forget just learning that from Barbara and sitting there with her and just thinking this woman is really absolutely a trailblazer, is amazing, and she's willing to share some lessons with me about broadcasting. And, uh, you know, it was just an honor, a true honor to sit on the set with her and to get a chance to talk with her about stories and also to learn in general in television news when she signed that huge contract at ABC News.
And so many of us women in particular were watching and following her and just so proud of this woman who, you know, just just broke down the barriers. And and we were watching and following along the way with all of her her the parts of her career and all those interviews and everything that she did and also the things that she had to endure. You know, you heard how Harry Reasoner wasn't that thrilled to have her next to him. And we knew that as a woman, she had to, you know, fight the battles. We watched it happen. But on the other hand, we also watched her just go through it with, with you know, with power and with inspiration and, and just in her inimitable way as she just secured interview after interview, you know, the one you just saw with the little clip with Monica Lewinsky and with world leaders and, you know, Putin and Gaddafi and all of those people. I, it was just, it was amazing to me as a woman to watch this woman just snare these interviews. And in spite of the fact that she had to deal with probably so much sexism, she, you know, she didn't let it stop her. She didn't let anything get in her way. And she was competitive till, till the end. But yet she also reached back and wanted to help other women. And I, I will never forget that. The fact that she looked at me as somebody she wanted to impart some some wisdom and some knowledge to it was important to her to also reach out to other women. So she was a trailblazer in every every aspect of her career. But she was also a woman who cared about other women following behind her, uh, you know, that legacy that she was that she was building, and 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 we could see that happening with her. And and I just I I just still to this day just counted as just such a a blessing and an honor that I had an opportunity to sit uh, on the set with her, to uh, sit down the hall from her in an office just, you know, right within view of hers and to get a chance to, to see her, walk through the hallway, to talk with her and to, to count her as a colleague as well as, a, you know, a friend and somebody who I looked up to. So Barbara just, uh, you know, set the standard. She was the bar. I remember uh, Oprah talking on her program about how she mimicked Barbara with her you know, hairbrush, I guess it was, maybe pretending to be Barbara Walters. Well, mm -hmm. so many of us did that. You know, we mimicked her her intonations in how she interviewed people. We wanted to be like Barbara Walters. She set the standard. She, uh, you know, had a very high bar for so many of us. And to this day, I still think about the reporting that I do and how I want to honor Barbara in the way that I tell stories and what I do, and particularly as I inherit this program that she helped create. 2020. Fiercely competitive and I think you know motivated by the sexism, motivated by any hurdle uh, that was put in front of her and as David mentioned she did it with such grace. Um, Deborah, I want to talk about something you know our, our viewers across the country are watching this they're thinking of their own memories uh, of, of Barbara on TV interviewing whoever it is that that sticks out in their mind but I want to talk about her interview skills with you. You do this for a living. You're a fantastic interviewer as well. Um, you know, I watched and learned from Barbara. Not everybody in our business can ask a piercing, poignant question and do it in a disarming way. It's, it's yeah. a real talent. It's a real gift. She clearly had it. It's why the specials were so important and why people wanted to sit with her. Exactly. And I think that so many of us uh, look to Barbara as sort of, you know, the template. She was the master class of these interviews. And I watched her and I, you're absolutely right. She had a way of asking those hard questions. But we heard her just now when she said, you know, when she's asking Putin, I need to ask you a very difficult question. Or, you know, she would preface so many things. You might not like this, but I just need to ask you this. And I have to tell you, to this day, I think about Barbara when I compose some of my questions, when I have hard questions that I have to ask people. And I preface it sometimes very much like Barbara did. I want to talk to you about something. This might be hard for us to discuss, but let me ask you. Barbara had a way of, of sort of like asking those questions in a, in a way that, as you said, disarmed her, her subjects, but yet, you know, they didn't go fleeing from her interview chair. They didn't go, you know, you know, angrily away from the interview because she presented it in a way that they realized was fair. She needed to ask those questions. And I have to tell you, for so many of us, I think we look to Barbara Walters as, as you know, as, as the master of all of this. She, she 
taught us how to interview uh, people and how to do it in a way where you could get those unexpected answers uh, because she was just so masterful in how she asked those questions when she asked Monica Lewinsky questions. And I remember she said something like, oh, come on, you silly girl, or something to that effect, and made her laugh when she you know, got her to tell a little bit more about her experience. Barbara was just a master at these interviews, and she was always hard on herself. I would hear from other producers at the end of interviews, which we thought were brilliant, she would say, well, maybe I didn't ask this, or did I get to this, or maybe there was one more thing I could have done. She never stopped. She always felt like she could do more. And I have to tell you, Phil, I think she has, you know, she's really influenced me that way. When I finish interviews, I always feel like there was one more thing I could have done. There was something else I could have asked a little better. And that's Barbara Walter's influence right there at work with me, even to this day. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And it, part of her legacy is is making all of us uh, in this business better and want to strive to be better. Uh, that's just a beautiful part of her legacy as well. Deborah Roberts, thanks so much for your thoughts tonight as well. My pleasure. Joining us now on the phone uh, is, is, is another woman in our business who, who asks questions like that and disarms people as well. Uh, she's been doing it for, for decades in the business. Katie Couric. Katie, thanks so much. For, for taking the time tonight to share some thoughts uh, about Barbara's passing and her life. Hi, Phil. Happy, happy to do so because Barbara was somebody I admired deeply. Um, I think she saw me as sort of, uh, a, saw us as very much alike. She used to say that neither of us was very glamorous. I never knew whether to take that as a compliment or not, but she is really the OG of female network news anchors. Really, I think she really stands with people like Tom Brokaw, Peter Jennings, Dan Rather from that generation. And she broke the glass ceiling for all of the women who followed her. And, uh, you know, what I really admired about her, Phil, is she remained intensely competitive for years and years. And she had so much drive and ambition uh, for decades during her career, she never let up, and um, she was just a remarkable person. Uh, my husband and I, when I heard the news, we were laughing at the fact that what Barbara said to him once, well, clearly you're going to stick around, or clearly you're not going anywhere, so I better, I better learn your name. And we <laughs> laughed at that, but she was a remarkable person and a remarkable journalist, and as I said... Without Barbara, there would be, you know, I would never be able to have achieved what I had achieved in my career. And she did so much for women. I remember she wrote me a telegram when I interviewed uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, and uh, I surprised, he surprised me, and I, he, I didn't realize he was going to be at the White House, I was doing an interview with Barbara Bush, and she wrote me the nicest note. She was very supportive of other women, and I think she will be terribly missed, but always remembered as someone who, as I mentioned, paved the way for all of us. Katie, can you think back uh, early on in your career as, as you're watching other journalists, as we all do in this business when we enter it, we look to the journalists we, you know, that really hit home in the way they're asking questions, in the way they're uh, you know, presenting stories. I'm wondering early on in your career, or even, you know, you know, even recently, uh, are, there, are there any stories uh, that you can remember that stand out in your mind, interviews uh, that Barbara did where you said, that's it? That's how you do it. Well, you know, there are almost too many to mention. I mean, world leaders, Yasser Arafat, Anwar Sadat. You know, I think she was as comfortable interviewing these huge political leaders and, and global leaders as she was interviewing celebrities. You know, she she got a lot of grief for kind of her style of interviewing celebrities, but she got them to be so revealing you know, whether it was she was sitting on the floor of a house with Eddie Murphy, I believe she did that, or talking to Christopher and Dana Reeve. I, I remember wanting that interview so badly. And, you know, it was always trying to get the get, right, the big interview. 
And more often than not, Barbara, by virtue of her incredible reputation and, you know, being at the top of her game for so many years, she inevitably got all the major interviews. But I remember watching that hour and she dealt with that story with such sensitivity and compassion. And it was so difficult. And Chris and Dana were such heroes of everyone. Um, And I remember thinking, you know, I'm so glad Barbara did that interview because she brought a, a certain grace and compassion and care that I think was honestly unparalleled. Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful sentiment, especially from a competitor. Uh, Katie, what is it that n- allowed Barbara to be so disarming? I was just talking to Deborah Roberts about this. Asking yeah, I was world, listening to Deborah. Yeah, asking world leaders questions that would make them uncomfortable that they normally would not want to answer if it was anybody else. But she set the question up or she asked it in a certain way. That's a, that's a real gift that Barbara had. Yeah, and I think that takes a a tremendous amount of confidence. And, you know, when Barbara was co-anchoring the uh, Today Show, it was in Frank McGee's contract that he had, that he was, um, that he had the ability to ask three questions before Barbara asked one to really kind of show who was in charge. I cannot really emphasize enough how much, BS Barbara Walters had to deal with in TV news in those early days of her career and quite frankly, throughout her career. She was always advocating for herself. She was always pushing in a way that a lot of her male colleagues didn't have to do. So, you know, I think that, that she withstood that and kept going and never gave up is a real testament to her spirit and her determination and her ability because I think she had to prove herself almost every time she went on the air. And I think the fact that she was almost fearless and guileless with her questions, and I think that was part of her skill that she would disarm people. And, you know, she was sort of like a a velvet hammer when she would interview people, I don't think they expected some of her questions uh, that that probably took them by surprise. But I think that was part of her skill. And that's why I think she was able to get really wonderful answers from people that that many of her fellow journalists just could not solicit. A velvet hammer. Katie Couric, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to to help us celebrate Barbara's life uh, as we mourn her passing as well. Well, thank you, Phil, for having me. We're going to be joined now by uh, Joan London on the phone as well. Uh, Joan, thanks for taking the time uh, to to call in right now. You're happy to be with you, Phil, but not for this occasion. Oh, of course. I know that all of us who knew Barbara so well have been you know, concerned about this day coming because she's been ill for so long. But, boy, I remember when I first started in television in 1975, my first job was to watch her every single morning at my little, you know, NBC affiliate in Sacramento, California. And then I could take from their show, from the Today Show, story. So that was literally my job was every single morning to watch her. And when I came to New York... And I remember the first time they told me at Good Morning America that I was going to be co-hosting the next day with Barbara when David Hartman was off. I was uh, I was intimidated. Like, she was my idol. She was my role model. And I remember she came in. And when I first started Good Morning America as the co-host, I had just had a child. And, I, and ABC was wonderful that they let me bring that baby to work. And it was just so unheard of. And I remember Barbara came upstairs from the studio up by the makeup room and she was standing behind me, looking at me and then looking into my, this little dressing room next to mine, looking at this baby there sleeping in a crib. And she said, I just can't even believe that, that this is happening. 
Like they, I would never have been allowed to bring my child to work with me. And I remember when she was hosting with me, the thing that was the most important to me is that she took me aside during a commercial break. And she said, I'm going to give you some advice. She said, don't fight. Or don't try to get 50-50 here. And you're going to hear from women all over that are going to say, you don't get as many stories, you don't get as much time on the air, but you just have to know it's not just television, it's the society. It isn't ready yet to give a woman a 50% share of a show like this. So I'm going to tell you how you're going to make yourself in this business. You take every small story that they are willing to give you, and you make every one of those shine. You just make them the best that they can be. And if you do that, your star will rise. And she said, and here's another piece of advice. She said, thank you notes. She said, after every interview, write a thank you note. She said, people always wonder how I get these big interviews. She said, when I see, you know, a, like a little bit of news that, you know, some celebrity has been cast to a movie or has, or to a Broadway show, I immediately write a note to them. I immediately reach out, say, oh, what wonderful news. You're going to be fantastic in this. She said, and then when the movie comes out, who do you think they call? They call me because I've already been, I've already got the ball rolling. And certainly after that, um, I started writing those thank you notes, and I got to tell you, I had a lot of interviews that I got on the days that David Hartman was gone, because that's the only time I got a big interview back in those days, kind of like Barbara. And I wrote thank you notes, and sometimes they would come back on and say, and I want Joan to do the interview. <laughs> David Hartman would say, wait a minute, she's not supposed to be doing that interview. And I would get it, and the reason why was from the advice of Barbara. So something as simple as thank you notes, and by the way, that's not just for the TV industry, it's for any industry. But she worked hard to get all of those interviews. They didn't just come to her. Nothing was given to her over the course of her career. Oh, as you said, she, in that moment, she was teaching you to be undeniable, oh. right? Yes. She was, she had such a confident demeanor. There was just something, there was just this air of confidence, you know, that certain men have and that certain women have. And she had that. When they talk about an it factor, her it factor was an incredible strength and confidence. Now, saying that is one thing, but I remember when she first came to ABC. I was at Eyewitness News at the time in New York, and I remember there were the stories were that uh, Sam Donaldson. I remember there was a story that he went running through the halls, yelling, "The women are coming! The women are coming!" <laughs> and Harry Reasoner was so irate. Um, I, I talked to someone one time who rode up in the elevator with them the first night to do that first night that she joined him on on the network news and he wouldn't speak to her in the elevator. I mean, to say that she was not welcomed with open arms would be the understatement of the century. I mean, she, and she fought the same battle when she was at the Today Show. Yeah, and, and, and we have to think that in the grand scheme of things, this wasn't altogether that long ago. And yet she mm -hmm. dealt, no, she dealt with all of this. And then so, so many women in this business, remarkable women in this business like you who came after, um, you know, you were fortunate enough to work with her and get advice from her. Uh, I'm curious b before you go, when you were out in Sacramento and, and this is before you knew Barbara, but you were watching her every morning, what are some of the, the traits that you saw as a young journalist that you wanted to emulate? She was comfortable in her own skin. I, I remember they went on a tour. Um, I remember watching this, and they toured all around um, the United States from a different place all the time. And ironically, years later, Charlie Gibson and I would do the same thing. We would, you know, with Good Morning America, t take tours all around the country. But I remember watching her, and some mornings she would be there, and she would have like a, a little kerchief on, like her hair would be pulled back, and she'd literally have like a scarf on her head 
And she was like, well, you know, I mean, basically what she was saying is that we're in wherever we are. We don't have time for a lot of hair and makeup and I'm just here. And uh, and she was just always so comfortable. And, you know, that kind of being at at ease on television. Um, And she, by the way, she was totally the same way in real life. She was just always at ease and she had this way of making you feel at ease. So, I mean, I'm telling you how she made me feel at ease, but that is what she also did, obviously, with her guests. And, you know, people have asked me what the hardest part was of doing Good Morning America. And I said, well, you know, we got briefed ahead of time. We read people's books. We watched their movies. We had our questions. What was the hardest thing was making the guest, the person that you were interviewing, comfortable. And sometimes big stars would really be nervous and uncomfortable. And that was our job to make them comfortable. And Barbara was just, that was one of her real true um, capabilities in being in a, the, the, the business of journalism, was being able to make someone else feel comfortable and feeling like they were safe with you. And by the way, and then once she got them feeling safe with her, that was when she could ask those questions. <laughs> That's right. That's when she asked those really tough questions. Yeah. Uh, Joan London, thank you. I, I think I think you point something you point out something that is really important. Barbara was comfortable in her own skin. That is not yeah. as easy as it sounds. And and I think being so comfortable in her skin made some of the people she interviewed really uncomfortable. And I think that was <laughs> that, that was part of her genius. Uh, Joan London, thank you so much for helping us celebrate her life tonight. My pleasure. Thanks, Phil. Okay. Uh, Joining us now on the phone is Connie Chung, uh, someone else who, uh, with a remarkable career, had Barbara Walters, um, you know, sort of pave the way, as we all did. Connie, thanks so much for for taking the time to share your thoughts. Oh, well, my goodness. I I must tell you that I I so admired Barbara. Uh, She was indefatigable. I, I first met her in 1969. I was working at a local station in Washington, D.C., and I wanted to interview her, so she agreed to meet me, and she picked me up in her limousine at the southwest gate of the White House. I met her there. I hopped in, and I kind of gave her an idea of what the interview was about, and and it was something stupid. But she she agreed to do it, and she, uh, she scheduled it with me. Later, um, when I went on to CBS News, um, she was she was at NBC at the Today Show, and um, I was I was doing uh, I was covering local news I mean uh, Washington news, politics etc. for Walter Cronkite, and Walter respected Barbara. There was an incredible story back uh, when. Uh, the Middle East was uh, the big news of the hour because Sadat and Begin were supposed to meet. And um, Walter Cronkite had an interview lined up with both of them. Uh, they were on a plane flying with he, Walter was on a plane flying with Sadat and Megan. Barbara shows up on the tarmac, waving frantically, saying, don't leave yet, wait for me. And so Sadat looks out there and sees her and says, Baba, Baba. I, and he got the plane to wait for Barbara. When she got on, she decided she would surreptitiously find a way to get an interview with Sadat and Began before Walter did. She sent them a little note and said, will you do an interview with me first? Check one box, uh, yes, no, or whatever. They said yes. And she, she scooped, she... She beat out Walter Cronkite, and I'm telling you, Walter respected her terribly. She, he really respected her, unlike some of the younger anchors who came along later, 
who engaged in audacious behavior, rude, disrespectful, and I was appalled. I was really appalled at so many of the younger people who came along and disrespected her. Um, I must tell you, Phil, I followed in Barbara's footsteps. Um, as you know, when she co-anchored, when she was named co-anchor with Harry Reeser, he despised her. And then 20 years later, Barbara was the first woman to co-anchor um, the evening news. It was the uh, ABC News, of course. And I was the second. It was 20 years later. And I, too, um, was not quite welcome by my co-anchor. And um, when I was dumped after two years, as she was dumped after two years, only Barbara Walters could console me because she knew exactly how it felt. Um, I also followed in her footsteps when uh, we both forgot to have a baby. So Barbara adopted a baby and I adopted a baby. So is there anyone who hasn't followed in her footsteps more than I have? Um, she also, oh, one other thing, Barbara basically supported her, um, her family. You know, her father was a nightclub owner and it crashed and she was the sole support of her mother and her father and her sister who uh, uh, had a disability. And I was the sole support of my parents as well. So we both felt that we needed to have a, um, a job. And we, we did what we had to do. Uh, I, Barbara was an amazing, incredible woman. She was competitive as heck. And yet, um, when I was competing against her, she would send me a note saying, you did a great job. I'm glad you got it. And um, she would send me these Barbara Grahams, these lovely letters. Um, then I came to ABC to work with her. And believe me, her competitiveness was very clear to me. I saw her MO, and she scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> I would not compete with Barbara because Barbara, you know, was the winner always um i remember one time she uh oh i know what it was when i when i was dumped at cbs she called me immediately just the way um joan london was saying she called me immediately and she set her sights on getting the first interview with me after i had been uh sitting fallow and of course I gave it to Barbara. You know, who else? She would send letters and notes and faxes and call. She would call. She knew exactly how to get an interview with anybody and everybody. That Walter Cronkite story uh, you, you told is, is so great. There was so much to respect about Barbara Walters, but in this business, nothing makes you respect someone more than someone beating you on a story. Um, and even being able to beat Walter Cronkite. Uh, Connie Chung, thank you so much for calling in and, and helping us remember and celebrate Barbara tonight. All right. I'll miss her terribly, Phil. So many people do this evening. Connie, thank you. Thank you. One of our former colleagues here at ABC News, Elizabeth Vargas, is on the phone now as well. And Elizabeth, you knew Barbara well for years. Um, let's start by your, your immediate first thoughts tonight on her passing. Well, obviously, it's devastating news. It's sad. Um, she lived an incredible life. Uh, we should all be so lucky to live a life as full as hers and as long as hers. Um, but 
Barbara was amazing. I mean, I I was I was the person who replaced her as the anchor of 2020, and it was daunting to say the least. I don't think there have been bigger shoes to fill in this business. She was extraordinary and extraordinary to watch, and it was a gift for me as an you know young and up and coming journalist to be able to watch her and the absolute meticulous way she prepared for all of those interviews. Uh, you know, whether they be world leaders or um, people in the media or people in the arts, she was incredibly meticulous and took in extraordinary care uh, preparing for those interviews. And she was a ferocious competitor, as Connie was just talking about. Anybody who worked with her knew that. She wanted to win. She wanted to, you know, get the interview. She wanted to get it first. If it meant chasing a plane down a tarmac, that's <laughs> what she did. Um, but I just have to say also... Um, she was a real motherly figure in many ways. Um, you know, I when I went moved from NBC to ABC, she really uh, took me under her wing, uh, gave me some very uh, important and needed advice, you know, in making a transition like that. Um, and by, you know, just power of example, as well as pulling me aside saying, hey, let me straighten this out for you and show you what's going on. Um, she was an incredible colleague that way. Um, you know, every single woman in television news, we all owe her uh, an enormous debt of gratitude for helping to shatter that glass ceiling and, and, and blaze a trail that we have all followed. Um, it doesn't mean it was all easy for everybody who came after. You heard Connie had a lot of those same battles as well. Uh, women today still face some of the same battles and pressures of being in this business that she faced. But none of us would have had the chance to do it as early um, as we did um, if she had not gone first. And, you know, as hard as this business may be in many ways on women, I think, in particular, um, she was the first person. And I think it was hardest for her. So it makes all of her accomplishments, all of her feats, all of her generosity as a colleague, um, all of her leadership in a newsroom and on a show even more extraordinary. You talk about her being a motherly figure, uh, a woman like yeah. a woman like Barbara, who had the career that she had and did what she did, trailblazing, um, to turn around and to give you the advice she gave you, uh, even as you were stepping up and, and taking her position, um, to give you to give you that advice, and and we hear it from everybody who's who's talked to us tonight uh, that she wanted to reach back and help. Um, that, that's her. I think that's a remarkable quality of someone who was as was larger than life in this business well it's it's you know re reaching back behind you and helping the women coming up behind you is what makes people remember you i mean those are the truly great people i think and l don't get me wrong she was tough i mean she would tell me when you know i think 2020 you guys need to do this more or do <laughs> that more what are you doing that for um you know she did not hold back but you know, during, uh, you know, a, 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 a very brief sort of difficult period of time that I had at ABC, she was the one person who pulled me aside and said, I think you need to know what's happening here. Let me fill you in and, and did. And that was extraordinary. She was also one of the funniest, bodiest people you'll meet. Um, sitting next to Barbara at a dinner party, that's the best seat. Um, <laughs> she was great. She had great stories. Um, you know, she held her own. She was a real, um, she was not guarded that way. And that was really a lovely aspect to her because I think a lot of people in the public eye can tend to sort of guard themselves and not show their cards as much. But I, you know, when I say the word motherly figure, I use that, that term deliberately. Mothers can give you you know, a support and they can tell you tough things when you need to hear them. And that's what Barbara did in both of those things in spades. And that's what made her an incredible role model. Um, she would tell you what was up and what was down and what's working and what's not. And sometimes, you know, you would say you would argue back and disagree. And But um, it, it was really important to get that kind of feedback from somebody who had been there and walked the path before you. Elizabeth Vargas, thanks so much, and I appreciate you mentioning her sense of humor. I think uh, her sense of humor and her charm showed up all the time uh, in She's her hilarious. remarkable interviews. She's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> I'm still talking about her in the present tense, but it's I'm, it's very, very sad to hear this news, um, and I'm really, really thinking about her a lot tonight.
We all are. Elizabeth Vargas, thanks so much. All right, now we, now we want to turn to David Sloan, longtime executive producer uh, with Barbara Walters. David, thank you. I know this must be a uh, very difficult uh, and, and, and sad night for you, and, and yet you spend so much time uh, with Barbara working on such extraordinary projects. Um, first of all, I'm so sorry uh, for your thank loss, you, as Bill. I know you were so close with her. Uh, can yeah, you talk a little bit about her? Sure. We knew this day was coming, but it's... Um, it really hits you, um, and it's just yeah. My heart's really full tonight because um, uh, it's full of joy and exhilaration at having watched Barbara work and learning from Barbara. She was not only a, a friend and a colleague, but she was also a mentor. She was a teacher, and um, it was she had this extraordinary library in her head of journalistic tools that she applied to everything she did. And, you know, one of, it's interesting. One of the things she really hated being called was um, an icon, especially in the last part of her career. She says, I can't stand being called an icon. She says, I'm just a reporter. And I said, no, you're not, Barbara. You're not just a reporter. But for her, it was so much about the work, which she cared so deeply about. She didn't really want to be an icon. She wanted to be a working reporter talking to people about the things that were important to them and surprising us at home um, and, and really marveling at, at this woman who was able to talk to, you know, the, the biggest movie stars to the, um, to, to world leaders. I mean, being able to get a president on the phone at, at a moment's notice, this was a woman that you could feel the power from. Um, but it's, it's also interesting that she always had this sort of, quiet self-doubt about her um about herself too i mean her book was called her autobiography, her autobiography was called audition she was always felt auditioning and i remember at one of her retirement um parties she got this standing ovation in the middle of the gma studio and she said to me wow they really like me and i said after all this time of course they do barbara you were Barbara Walters. Um, but there was always this sort of quiet self-doubt. And it wasn't really false modesty. It was really, um, it was a little bit of it was humility in a lot of ways. Um, and she never rested on her laurels. Every interview she did was from scratch, almost as if she had never done it before, which gave her this sense of wonder um, about the work that she brought to, with, her, with, with interviews. It was really startling to watch really startling to watch. And I feel so very, very lucky to have had Barbara as a teacher and a creative partner. David, you say something that I think, you know, people are going to take, um, take away from tonight and, and the people that we are, we are talking to from you know, Deborah Roberts, Katie Couric, uh, you now. Um, you say, she said, um, I'm just a reporter. And I think that speaks volumes about who Barbara Walters was and how she was able to do what she did in this business. There are a lot of people who would get to Barbara Walters standing in this business and believe their own hype. And you say she didn't want to be called an icon and she just felt like a reporter at heart. And I think that's one of the most remarkable things about her and probably why she was able to get those interviews, ask those questions because at times she didn't feel like Barbara Walters. She felt like a reporter who needed to ask tough questions and get the answers. Um, you know, it's funny, even the way she introduced herself to people that she didn't know. Um, I remember I was out to dinner with her one night and we were with a friend of mine and she turns to my friend and says, hello, I'm Barbara Walters. As if she were <laughs> like, we know who you are, Barbara. She had this, um, this, this quality where um, she, it didn't want to be, just as you said, Phil, she um, didn't want to sort of buy into um, the do you know who I am syndrome, which, uh, you know, uh, which she could have done. Um, but she was always very, um, uh, very careful with that. And, and, and there was a humility there um, that, was, uh, that was really remarkable for someone, um, for someone in her position. David, you worked on so many incredible stories, incredible interviews with Barbara. And, you know, I could ask you, you know, give me a memory of, you know, the most incredible uh, interview you were able to take part with in her. 
with her, but um, I, I want to ask you about her work ethic. There's been a lot said tonight about how fiercely competitive uh, she was, and she needed to be for you know more than one reason uh, in this business, especially at the time she was coming up in it, and how she was able to you know blaze a trail and break a glass ceiling. But talk a bit about her work ethic as she geared up to do one of these interviews. Well, it was everything was a D-Day landing. Every interview was. Uh, was done with a precision, uh, with about 50 index cards that she would write and rewrite and reorder. And we would always be called into her office to do a question session where we would go over them again and we would reorder them. And it was very easy to structure a Barbara Walters piece as you put it on television because the structure was in the questions. Everything was very, very precise. But, you know, I'm glad you asked this question, Phil, because in her study, in her apartment, she had a needlepoint pillow, and it said, once upon a time when there was time. Because this woman was always just so busy, 24-7. And I think the one thing she would have liked to have done in her life is probably had more personal time, had more time with, um, with family and friends. Um, but work was had a primacy for her. And um, I always remember the needlepoint pillow <laughs> once upon a time when there was time because she uh, time was important to her, but it was always well spent every single second budgeted for. And that's what made her so good. So prepared. So prepared. Thank you for that, David. It's really it's really nice to know about that pillow. Um, you know, we got the image <laughs> I of her. Of it. Sorry. I always think of it. Yep. Yeah, we got the image of her running down a runway after Sadat and, and now the pillow in her office. Uh, right. it's, it's, it's great. I'm curious, some of the things you learned by being her executive producer, working with her. Oh, um, well, that's a hard question uh, to answer because there are so many. But um, I, I think I, I mentioned earlier, never rest on your laurels. Always treat each new assignment like you've never done it before. Bring to it that freshness and originality and bring to it the work ethic as if this were your first job and you wanted to impress someone on your first day of work. And it's really that kind of um, serious-minded um, approach to one's work that really made her such, such an icon. There's that word again. Yeah, uh, she may not have liked that word, but it's exactly uh, what she what she is, what she was. There's so many people in this business. Um, there are so many things that could be said about Barbara. I'm I'm thinking about uh, being a young journalist. Any young journalist in this business uh, will probably describe this fire in their belly that they have for mm -hmm. being in this business, getting right in the middle of the, the biggest story that is that is out there right now, talking to the people who are making news, making news by talking to the right people. Um, I get that Barbara had that fire in her belly up until today, I'm guessing. Oh, uh, every, every second. Um, didn't flinch from an assignment. She was always game. Uh, really to do um, to do anything and would you know plane jump it was it was quite extraordinary um, it was it was very um, uh, it, it was just an automatic response and um, that's the kind of professional she was it was really um, it was it was a pleasure to watch and it was sometimes terrifying <laughs> to some of the things that she did going out on limbs and in interviews and, and also you had to show up and, and work as hard as she did and care as much as she did. You had to always be, you know, on point um, as she was. So she, you know, she, um, there were a lot of requirements. And because she had such high requirements for herself, and it was just a pleasure to watch. It was just exhilarating. David Sloan. Uh, longtime executive producer uh, for Barbara Walters. Thank you so much for taking the time. And again, uh, you know, we're all mourning her loss. I know how close you, you were with her, that you worked with her. Uh, so I, I, I will just say I'm sorry for your loss, um, you know. Thank you, Phil. As it is a loss Thanks for, for asking me. Yeah, David, thank you so much. Thank you. We've been talking a lot about how Barbara Walters asked questions. And it's safe to say nobody asked a question really like Barbara. Uh, she made an interview feel more like a conversation. That was the genius of it. But as those of us who had the privilege of working with her learned every day that, that a question was carefully crafted. Take a look. Well, 
The first thing I tell anybody who's going to be doing interviews is homework. I do so much homework, I know more about the person than he or she does about himself. At one point, you had terrible anxiety attacks. Mm -hmm. Oh, you did do your homework. Oh, I did do my homework. You did. <laughs> I, I don't know when I talked about that. How did you find that out? How did you find out about that? How do you know that? 2002, you told me you wanted to wait to have sex until after you married. I said that? You said you were a mama's boy. She wanted you she... to be a minister. You really are thorough with your research. Then I write, I can write 50 or 100 questions on little three by five cards. I put them in order, then I throw some away, then I put others in. Then if anybody comes in, if you've come in to deliver the soup, I say, do you, by the way, have any questions that you'd like to ask so-and-so? And I'm not kidding. Most politicians try to dodge questions. You have to push. You will hear me ask the question again and again. Okay, here it comes. <laughs> when will you, if you do, decide whether or not you are going to run for president? Well, it's such a difficult decision. And it's one that I am not going to rush into. Will you consider running for president in 2016? Well, that would be fascinating to me <laughs> as uh, well as everyone else. I have to push for the answer about whether or not you might run for yes. president. I'm flattered that people are talking about, but I haven't made up my mind. You really I haven't? really have not. What would it take to convince you to run? And you know, it's, that's all hypothetical. Does your husband want you to run? He is very respectful. He knows that this is... But he does want you to run. Well, he, he wants me to do what I think is right. I can spend hours, days, changing the order of questions. But here's the important thing. You gotta know your questions so you can throw them all away if you have to. I try to ask questions that people are not asked all the time, that make them think, that, that tell me something I haven't heard before. What do you think is the biggest misconception about you? That I'm flaky. But I am a little flaky. Yeah. So that's okay. What do you think is the biggest misconception about you? <laughs> no misconception. Brooding and difficult. That I'm not a real person. That I'm a bitch, maybe, if people think that. Now, uh, why do they think that? Why do you... Because I'm I mean, just why... like you. I have standards. I very often ask people, do you have a philosophy by which you live? It's a provocative question and a thoughtful question and sometimes very surprising answers. Do you have a philosophy by which you live? Doesn't everybody? Do you have a philosophy? Staying hungry. That's it. Do you have a philosophy by which you live? Life is a banquet and most poor suckers are starving to death. <laughs> I don't embrace negativity. I, I don't allow myself to be angry or, or bitter. Do you and the president have a philosophy that everybody is put here for a purpose and there's a reason for their life? I'm not a great planner. I just try and take each moment as it comes, you know, and try and be as truthful to myself in that moment as I can be. Do you have a philosophy? Mm, I guess. What? Unto thine own self be true. When I do an interview, I want a strong beginning and a strong ending. So in order to get that strong ending, I often ask, finish this sentence for me. Finish this sentence for me. Will Ferrell is... Funny, but... but honest and devilishly handsome. That'll do it. Usher is... Here. <laughs> Anne Hathaway is... Very, very, very over the moon happy. Mariah Carey is a nice girl. <laughs> Donald Trump is a good person. Chris Christie is 
a leader. Kanye West is black. That's the first thing that popped in my mind. Finish the sentence for me. Bill Gates is. Well, I think that's <clears throat> you know sort of an op oversimplification for anybody to say you know somebody is just one thing. Right now, Sharon Stone is. Really, really tired. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. Well, now that it's over, can I see your cards? <laughs> it, I bet a lot of people would have liked to have seen her cards. It is such a grand legacy, and those questions are such a huge part of it. More than two decades ago, Barbara had an idea to bring together women of different backgrounds, generations, and views to discuss the hot topics of the day. It had never been done before. 20 years later, The View is still going strong. Take a look. Group of people sitting together and talking unscripted. I thought it might last a year or two. Rue Knowledge, who was the president of ABC News, felt that my doing The View, a daytime show, would lessen my news credentials. So he didn't want me to moderate. She's the one in charge, Meredith Vieira. Yeah, you just remember that, Babs, OK? <laughs> so I chose Meredith Vieira to moderate. They told me part of my job would be ordering Barbara Walters around. How do you turn that down? It's a great gig. I have to take it. Then Rosie took on that role. No, it's, it's my first day on The View. I'm in the Meredith chair, and it's exciting. And then, of course, Whoopi. Good morning. I'm Whoopi Goldberg. It's a great place to express yourself, give opinions, show the kind of person you really are. I have been married more than once, and I never wanted to get married when I did. As I want. Okay. Come on. Oh, oh my God. And here in The View, I could be funny. I had women whom I could joke with. Oh, I always think of you not just as a friend or a sister, but as a lover. <laughs> and I could show good, better, and different my personality. When did you first learn about sex? Well, I didn't learn about sex until I started to do this show, and now I know more about sex than I ever wanted to know. We were the first daytime talk show to have a sitting president as a guest. Uh, look, I was trying to find a show that Michelle actually watched. <laughs> the view has shown that women can be together and enjoy each other and have the kind of conversations that you may have in the morning with a girlfriend. I will miss being with the women every day. I love you guys. I will miss giving my opinions. I think perhaps I will miss The View more than any other program I have done. And again, I wanted to read this statement tonight from Bob Iger, the CEO of the Walt Disney Company. He says, I have sad news to share today. Barbara Walters passed away this evening at her home in New York. Barbara was a true legend, a pioneer, not just for women in journalism, but for journalism itself. She was a one-of-a-kind reporter who landed many of the most important interviews of our time from heads of state, the biggest celebrities and sports icons. I had the pleasure of calling Barbara a colleague for more than three decades, but more importantly, I was able to call her a dear friend. She will be missed by all of us at the Walt Disney Company, and we send our deepest condolences to her daughter, Jacqueline. That is from Bob Iger. We're going to return now to regular programming. We'll have much more on Barbara's passing later on Nightline and, of course, tomorrow on Good Morning America plus a two-hour special Sunday night. Until then, I'm Phil Lipoff. Good night. This has been a special report.